And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother to the temple, coming to us straight from Pickpocket Press. Formerly the man behind Low Fantasy Gaming and Low Li and Low Life, the w and now coming back to us with the second edition of of Low Fantasy Gaming, now known as Tales of Argosa, the one and only Steve Grodd. How you doing today, man? Doing very well. Hello, 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 everybody, and thank you so much for having me on again, Mildred. I really appreciate it. So, it's 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 certainly been a bit. The last time I remember, I remember there was a board game that you were working on, but that um, but we yes, yes, we we don't we don't speak of the board game. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that was no. that was a case of ships passing in the night. Oh, uh, and I had been keeping an eye on Tales of Argosa for a while because I think I first caught wind that this was something that was going to be done right around the time that. Wizards of the Coast decided to be fucking idiots. Yes, that would be right. That would be right. Yeah, yeah. Around the OGL uh, incident. Yeah, the OGL incident. What? Um, almost one month. Uh, not one month. Almost one year to the day now. Now that we're in 2024, I can I can say that instead of calling it just the incident back in January. Uh. Yeah, yeah. That was that was that was. That was not good. <laughs> There's um, so many people. Put a lot I of people in jeopardy for. I, I was obviously I was at ground zero for everything. I was going through a mm. bunch. I was going through like hundreds of DM conversations with pe with people worried about it and what and what the next move was going to be. Um, I had I had a feeling this was not going to turn out in Watsi's favor from the from the word go, and some some people were. Um, saying that I was downplaying it. Uh, that and the reason why I said that I don't think this is going to go the way that the way that they're thinking is one. I'm not sure if you saw the post mortem that I did on the whole thing, but I remarked that I was being reminded of the first incarnation of the XFL under Vince McMahon, where it was very <laughs> clear that he had no understanding of football culture, and it's very clear that the that the new bo the new boss over at what over at Wizards of the Coast did not understand the ecosystem when it came to tabletop gaming, uh, especially with that yeah. virtual tabletop they pushed, which I still insist that, that thing is going to die. A, ver a well, that, very a yeah, very that's death. they're still yeah that, that's still they're still pushing ahead with that, aren't they? Sort of full steam. Um, they haven't yeah, made a, a whole lot of announcements time. about it, but they haven't said uh, that they're stopping it. So it's either a case mm. where they're gonna, where it's gonna quietly get sunsetted, like the last time they tried to do a virtual tabletop back in two thousand eight, mm. or it's go, or it's going to, or um, they're gonna keep going forward with it, and it's gonna, and it's gonna get its. It's going to get shown its ass once it has to actually compete with the likes of Roll Twenty and, and Foundry and Shard and every and Fantasy Grounds and everybody else. Because that was that was the whole thing that was that was making me like this is going to fail because all of the all of those VTCs I mentioned are very feature rich. That's the baseline you've got to meet. If yeah, you know, and they don't have a good good track record for um as you're saying that 2008. Well. Uh, Attempt, I was so. I was perplexed when I found out that they were get, that they were doing 3D graphics because the only one I can think of that does that is Tailspire and that one's got a bit of a height got a bit of a higher ceiling than the rest. Mm, mm, mm. But then I found out why at that summit, which unfortunately I was not at the summit. Otherwise, you would have heard about it because I guarantee you I would have caused a scene. Uh -huh. <laughs> Oh, probably get myself kicked out of it of any media appearances, but worth it. <laughs> but <laughs> look, I've been banned. From, I've been banned from a Starbucks before, so so precedent. Uh, there's worse things to get upset about than your coffee. 
<laughs> it wasn't, it wasn't even that big. Know, a, it wasn't even that big yeah. a deal. I just kept, I just kept fucking with the guy because he kept insisting <laughs> that I use the proper names for the sizes. Oh god! And I'm like, if it if it yeah. walks like a duck, talks like a duck, and quacks like a duck, it sure as hell ain't a goose. <laughs> <laughs> but apparently, the reason that they decided to use the Unreal Engine was because they wanted to put that virtual tabletop on consoles. Okay. Yeah, right, I read it. Mm. That is pants on head stupid. Oh. Because if somebody wants if some if somebody wants a um a D and D experience on their console, they're gonna they're just gonna they're just gonna play like Dragon Age Inquisition or Baldur's Gate three or something. Well that's it's, my thing about it too, is that it's with the three D graphics and special effects, the graphics and all that, there's so much it's so getting so close to a computer game that you may as well just play. I mean, not exactly because I I was you, I was you gonna are maybe friends, but yeah, I was going to say that they'd be better off just making a computer game. But then I remember Dark Alliance from a couple years ago and how well that turned out. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, didn't they just do? Isn't Baldur's Gate just out? It's pretty awesome from what I yeah, have but heard. Here's the thing. My... Here's the thing. Yeah, Wizard of the Coast had sweet fuck all to do with it. <laughs> Uh, All that well, they that explains did why it's so specific. awesome. <laughs> that game was handled by Larian Studios, who's more or less been making that game for about tw for about twenty years now, <laughs> just without oh, the shit, license. Okay. Because up until this point, they were the team behind the Divinity series. Okay. So, okay. like I said, they've been making D they've been making D and D um, computer games for tw for twenty years. Oh, okay, okay. So they just licensed it, and off they went, and made it—you know—made it themselves, and it and it turned out good. Yeah, by sounds of it. You know, because that's the smart thing. Instead of trying to, instead of trying to do it yourself when you've got no mm -hmm. idea on how video game design works, just hire people who do know it and and say, "Here's the here's the license. Just make sure you're not doing anything stupid with it with any of the IP, and that's and that's all you're going to hear from us." Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I. I'm sure I worked out from. I'm sure I got a chunk of change out of, out of, they, out of that. They did, but not as much as people yeah. would think. Like they got a pittance out of the out of the whole deal. Oh, well, I'm glad someone's making decent mm -hmm. RPG games anyway. Yeah, but it's the it's and of course Baldur's Gate three is also on console, so it's a case of I get. So it's a case of what's the point? And I guess the best analogy I can think of is why um, why mo why most for why most four X style games don't put a lot of focus on console. Like I'm not gonna, I'm not going to see a console port of Stellaris or Endless Space. Oh, uh, because it it's been tried. It just doesn't it just doesn't pan out because the because um that's not a game style that's really conducive to consoles unless you specifically build around it. And a lot of the market for like 4X or RTS is very much a PC end of things. That's going to be the majority. And it's just a function of having a keyboard or I mean you can have keyboards on your consoles now with all the um my son's got a Oh you can you can but keyboard that's... like lights up. It's got it's got all sorts of Lights going on and off with it. He does most of his, um, you know, Fortnite gaming and all that on there. But uh, I mean, I suppose the PCs, they got, well, I don't know. Do they still have? I've been out of the computer games for a while just because my laptop can't run them. But um, I assume the PCs are still more powerful than the. It's, than the, um, it's not consoles. really an issue of power. It's an issue of. Uh, a control interface that j that's go that's um just not going to fit. Your oh, okay. the amount consider the amount of commands you have to you have to keep an eye out for in say civilization or e or even or even old Warcraft. Yeah, okay. And trying to and trying to do that on like a PlayStation controller. Oh yeah, there's no chance. So, and I I know some people will bring up Halo Wars when I br when I mention this, but that was specifically designed for consoles. Same with say Knights of the Old Republic, as opposed to like like um, Baldur's Gate Two or Neverwinter Nights. 
I know that's I know that some of those kind of games have been ported over to consoles, but the I guarantee you, if I if I were to look at the numbers, if I could actually get them on the console end, which I can't, the majority are going to be doing it on um on p on PC. That's just that's just how that's just how it's going to work. There's no there's no getting around that. Um. In the same in the same vein, I'm pretty sure most people playing Street Fighter aren't playing it on PC. They're playing it on consoles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, each has got its strengths. I yeah. suppose doesn't it? each platform. And yeah, well, to... I do look forward one day to getting back to the um, mm -hmm. computer games. I keep telling my wife that um, you know, one day <laughs> some spare well, money, yeah, just... <laughs> better get a big, a powerful gaming uh, PC. I've got one that's decent enough. It's just it's just that I haven't had I haven't um made myself sit down and start and start playing because I'm a workaholic. Um, uh -huh. I, I am intending to change that next next week because oh. because next Monday I'm going to start game streaming. Um, oh, all right. Nice. Um the but getting but getting past that, I th with getting back to the heart to the heart of the matter. When you just when you decided to ha to hammer d hammer down and actually do I, what at the what did you know do this did you know it was going to be that you were going to rebrand it as Tales of Argosa or in the initial drafts was it still Low Fantasy Gaming Second Edition and if so what prompted the name change? Uh, it was always going to be a name change because one of the one of the big complaints, not big, a, a common complaint <laughs> with my fantasy game or LFG was that the name's terrible. It's not inspiring. And I mean, Tales of Argosa in many ways probably isn't much better, but uh, I do have, I've had the, uh, it, well, it's called the Midlands Low Magic Sandbox setting, which is set in Argosa. Well, the main, the main land there is Argosa. Um, and I had that in my, I've had that around for years. And I thought, well, when I do this second edition of um, LFG, I'll try and tie it more closely to the setting, which is our ghost. And actually, you know what? It was because the original plan, in fact, was just to do a box set of the Midlands. So to do a box set of the setting. And as I was getting ready to sort of do that, and that came about because, actually because of the board game. So I was trying to do old mage to board game, which didn't quite get there, but um, I learned a lot about shipping, box sets, um, you know, distribution and uh, bloody GST and stuff in all different countries. Um, anyway, and at the end of that sort of saga, I decided that, okay, well, actually... Um, what would be nice to do is an old school sort of box set of the Midlands, and so that was going to be our ghost. And then, but then I sort of went, "Oh, hang on, well, if I'm going to if I'm going to do this, it probably to do it, you know, kind of to do it right." You know, there was some aspects of LFG that over time I've come to not like as much, and so I wanted to, you know, fix that or you know tweak it, bring it up to date. So I just thought, well, okay, before we do, before I do the box set, let's uh update the core rule set and so yeah anyway that's how it sort of came about and so yes it was always it was never low fantasy gaming second edition it was always tales of my ghost or something like that you know mm -hmm. and uh something to do with that ghost so i uh, the and that is the name any better i don't know <laughs> i it's come to grow on me hopefully it will grow it, on people it certainly has more of more of an more of an identity and it for me for me at least it helps that it's that is directly tied to a setting because I've I think I've told you this before a a big pet peeve of my of mine that I have with so many um quote unquote fa quote unquote fantasy uh -oh, I games. I have lost you. Hold on a minute. Oh uh, no, I'm still connected. All right, how about now? Oh yes, I can hear you now. Yeah, what I was saying was that a, a pet a pet peeve I have with a lot of fantasy games. Is mm. not knowing whether to not is the whole playing half seas regarding wh regarding what kind of fantasy they are or what sort of setting they're trying to encourage. 
know, a I lot of a lot are trying a lot of a lot of them try to do this kitchen sink approach as it, as mm. if fantasy is this one size fits all affair. You know, because because imagine imagine saying that Conan and um Lord of the Lord of the Rings are the same because they're both fantasy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, yeah. I realize that's yeah. I realize that's a bit extreme, but I I think you get the um point. <laughs> Whereas Yeah, no, absolutely. I think even with even with low even with low fantasy gaming, it always struck me as leaning heavily into sword and sorcery. You know, your your Conans, mm. your Fritz, Le your Fathford and the Grey Mauser, your um, your um, I was gonna I was gonna say Moorcock, but I'm not sure if that would really count. Your yeah, Cole, your S Solomon Kane. I. I know a lot of people bring up Elric when it comes to sword and sorcery. I, I don't really see it. Like it's far, yeah, yeah, I, I it's it's far. To, the eternal champion concept is, and the fact that you're dealing you're dealing with these competing pantheons, I find it far too high concept for sword and sorcery. Yeah, okay. I, I am not super familiar with Eric. I I know he carries around a demon sword, mm -hmm. which is going to be um, uh, kind of contrary to the tra traditional sword and sorcery where the... Oh, well, it's not, because the magic is sort of dark and um, ruinous, I suppose, but... Um, you have that, you have, yeah, the, you have the, the, law, the gods of law and chaos, and neither of them are... Uh, yeah. all, both si okay, sides okay. are assholeish. There is a lot of <laughs> the the fact that the fact that there is th that there is this theme of a eternal champion and Elric is just one incarnation of that, and just so, right, so right. much of the cosmic aspect doesn't str doesn't strike me as sort as sword and sorcery. Um, yeah. Okay. 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 Yep. Yep. Not in the traditional sort of Conan sense where, um, it, well, there's none of that um, law versus chaos stuff, is there? From what I remember, with Co with Conan, no. Mm. The, if there is an enemy in in the in a lot of Robert E. Howard's work, it is his view. It is his view of civilization. You know. Yeah. And part part of that has to do part of that has <laughs> to do with when um the t when um a lot of the oil barons came in into the t in a, into the town that he grew up in when the when that place struck oil. And a lot of the decadence of civilization came along with it, oh, which I'm I'm vastly simplifying, yeah, yeah. but that certainly played into a factor. And also, con consider the type, consider the most common type of enemy of Conan, you know, sor sorcerers. These high, these high intellect, high grandstanding type of pe type of people who are messing with powers they really shouldn't be. Yeah, well, absolutely. There's decadence is a major theme mm. through out a lot of his stories and, as well, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I didn't know about the oil oil barons thing. Yeah, and of course, of course. Well, the big the big reason why he goes with the whole proto Celtic thing is he grew up in a in the era of Irish need not apply. Keep in mind this that um the that um his his stories first started showing up in the 1920s. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh. And of course, of course, there's also the fact that there's there's always been the implication of of an almost post-apocalypse, since it's implied to be taking place shortly after the fall of Atlantis. Yeah. Oh, that's right. You know, there's ruins to explore and or lost cities. And um, I've always I've always held. I've never been able to get any concrete proof of this, but I've always held this feeling that the reason why you see so many ancient lost civilizations in fantasy is in part is in part the the impact of the fall of Rome, and and ju and just the just the ru just the ruined artifacts from the from the Romans because of how far spread. Oh they yeah, were. yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I got gotcha, you. I got gotcha. you. I know that the Mongol Empire had more territory, but the Mongol Empire wasn't. It was was not. It was far less civilized. 
but didn't build as much. Mm-hmm. No, they just go. <laughs> they just go in, wreck everything, and then salt the earth. So take it. Grows take it all. all. <laughs> and then, yeah. yeah. And then, on, then on to the next place. But yeah. Now, even even though Tales of Argosa is a successor to low fantasy gaming, continuity wise, mm. it is a fo- is a follow up to um, low life. And would it oh, be fair yeah. of me to mm. say that there were so- that there were some. There were some element. There were some learning experiences you took from low life and applied them to Tales of Argosa. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, that's right. With with low life, I low life twenty ninety. I wanted to go almost the opposite way to um, low fantasy gaming. So in LFG, you had a lot of hit points, and um, it was very much an attrition based game. In low life. 2090 it was sort of not exactly the opposite it, there was still resource management involved in you know using your abilities and so on um and recuperating them at certain points if you made your will checks but um we reduced the hit points massively and we increased the damage on the guns um compared to lfg and it sort of became this anti-attrition game where you, you Combats were over in two or three rounds because no one had any hit points and the guns did a lot of damage. And I thought that's that's totally fine. For the purposes of a cyberpunk style game, if you get get you and oh that's right, the other thing we put in there was um major thing was these trauma tables where you can get your arm blown off or whatever. Uh and that's that was awesome for a cyberpunk style game because of course you can just replace your arms, no problem. Um and so it was a very it was an extra deadly sort of game in Low Life 2090. And, but when we, when we were playing that and playtesting and the feedback we got from that generally was that, uh, you know, that was well received. They really, the, the players seemed to really like that style and the GMs of, of game because you didn't need many opponents to threaten the party. Um, combat was quick, which then freed up session time for other things, right? So, by the time Tales of Argosa um, rolled around, yeah, there's a few, you know, different pieces. So we've reduced the hit points a lot in uh, Toa, as I usually shorten it to. Uh, compared to LFG, it's it's uh, basically hit points just start out as your con score. So if you've got con 12, you get 12 hit points, plus a bonus based on your level, one to three points. Uh, you know, Magic user gets one, Fighter gets three um and then each level after that you just get a set amount based on your level so one to three points and that's it so the, the hit points sort of range from 10 up to well, it only goes up to level uh nine so uh your hit points range from about 10 to 40 i suppose at the very top end um for a high level fighter and it just makes the um it's sort of like i think that's the somewhere in there is the, the 20 to 30 range i think is the sweet spot for most um sort of adventuring into ruins and dungeons and wilderness exploration that 20 to 30 hit point range just is a nice mm-hmm. amount which you know the gm can threaten with without too many monsters um and you know because the combat's a bit quicker because you don't need so many enemies um to sort of whittle down the the 80 hit points that the fighter now has uh so yeah we definitely brought the hit point reduction across and also the trauma tables have come across so mm-hmm. yeah we've got the blade trauma table the blunt trauma blast toxin uh missile trauma so anytime that there's a natural 19 roll on the um combat dice you will generally roll on one of the trauma tables and see what happens and so, you know, it might just be that uh, you're disarmed, but it might also be that your arm is cut off, <laughs> that sort of thing. So it makes the game more dangerous, certainly. And then a lot of the monsters also have uh, their own special effect on a natural 19. So it will either be roll on the trauma table or it will be, I don't know, something else. The, the troll, for example, if it rolls in that 19, eats one of your hirelings. Yeah. So just depends on the creature 
Yeah, and but yeah, that's a couple of things that came across from my life, and I and I think that's because I suppose my um, preferences have changed over time, and anytime I'm creating, you know, adventure or system or whatever, I'm always guided by. I, I you know it, I only make the stuff, I only make the games that I want to play myself. Mm. So. <laughs> Uh, I think my this, my preferences have changed over time, or maybe I've gone back to my original preferences back in the eighties. But um, certainly nowadays, I prefer a not a super deadly game, but a more dangerous game, um, and ideally one that you know runs a bit quicker. And then also, I'm very interested in um, this concept of emergent play. And trying to harness that mm. uh so yeah anyways that's some of the stuff that's yeah yeah come across from the life 2090 mm -hmm. and one of the th now one of the things that i um that i could i couldn't help but no i couldn't help but notice that was kind that was kind of amusing is just looking at the oh, i might have lost you again Yeah, sorry about that. Um, Discord does. Not I don't know. Check, check. Testing one two. Is Discord fucking with me again? <laughs> no, I can hear you now. I can hear you now. All right. Well, I will. I will admit one of the, one of the big one of the big changes is just in the presentation. Like there was the there was in in like the deluxe. Ver in like the normal and deluxe version of the original um, book, there what there um there was an attempt to have that to have that very um, parchment like design with the pages, and that's at least with Tales of Argosa, that's completely out. It's it's not only looking more um bla more black and white, but also almost reminds me of um M Magnolia's um particular style, especially with all of the heavy use of shadows. Oh yeah, okay. I'm not familiar with that exact style, but absolutely, we've gone for a more. Have you ever read Hellboy? Old school look. Hellboy. I have not read it, but I've seen the movies, <laughs> which is probably some kind of cardinal sin to have only seen the movies. But yeah, I'm not going to say it's a cardinal sin, but it's not going to really show that he that heavy use of shadow in the movies because, well, it's a nah. movie. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh yeah, no, definitely. I, it's it's. I've tried to go for a uh, much more old school look mm -hmm. to uh, this. Um, yeah, to to Toa, uh, partly because I think that the game does the adjustments that we've made to it ha do harken back more to old school style play with a little bit deadlier, a little bit quicker, mm -hmm. um, you know, and sort of sandbox style approach i think they they all um you know are consistent with a more old school um style and i think that the art uh and yeah you know if as long as it's good black and white art it's it's you know fully equally inspiring equally um you know beautiful to look at uh so i hope um people will be happy with that uh we'll have to wait and see but yeah we're it we're definitely trying to um capture a bit of that old school feeling i suppose with the with the black and white mm -hmm. and of, of course of course for me the i'm just i will always be grateful to whenever i whenever um i have whenever i have the presence of magic u users and not deal with um with the with the whole spells per day thing i've i think i mentioned this elsewhere but i'm not a big fan of the vancian model i never have been Oh, okay, okay, yep, yep. Oh. Oh, yeah, well, that's, yeah, that's definitely something we've... That, oh, yeah, so that's come from my life as well, is that it's it's now rolled a cast. Mm -hmm. I mean, we do still have a limit of... <clears throat> it's not like um, Dragon Warriors, for example, where you just keep casting until you fail, you check, and then you can't cast anymore. It's You roll a cast because we want to see if you get... Uh, because there's degrees of success on on the spells so uh you know you could get an 
normal failure, or you could get a terrible failure, which will trigger a dark and dangerous magic effect, or you could get a ordinary success or a great success, and then you'll get you know some kind of extra um, benefit out of the spell. And that actually sort of came about, yeah. So that was in low life as well, and that partly came about as a result of me um, playing dungeon crawl classics, where they've got massive, awesome massive tables for their spells and you can get all sorts of weird or you know massive range of results we sort of for this game we've really i mean it's not the same but it uh you know inspired by that in the sense that when you cast a spell you will get something you can get something a bit different each time depending on what happens um mm -hmm. with your role which i'm i'm fine with to that. make magic a bit more unpredictable you know what i mean um yeah compared to yeah for example classic D D magic where the spell is basically guaranteed, you know, subject to um, the saving throw, yeah. but it's quite predictable and straightforward. And in, in Toa, we've tried to make magic less predictable and uh, less straightforward, I suppose. Well, I've often said that for that for me, the the big reason why I've never been a fan of the Vancian model is there's never been enough of a in-universe reason for the whole you can only cast X amount per day and you have to memorize in advance. Oh, uh, uh, yeah. I'm, sh I'm, sure th I'm sure that if I dig around, I'll find some implied thing that ex that explains it, but my ruling has always been, if it's not in the book, it doesn't count. You know, huh. much, much, like ho much like how when, when some ho when some Hollywood director likes to, tries to add additional context to these to the story through interviews and the like and i'm like if it if if that if that was your intent you should have put it in the movie it's yeah, not in the movie yeah. i do not acknowledge it yeah yep yep i totally understand that mm -hmm. i mean in the, in the, i haven't read that many of the vents i have read some and i was super surprised about well that's the other how funny, much that's the other borrowed, thing. borrowed from it actually like the it, you know like the 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 terrific no the amazing prismatic spray or something that's straight out that that's the name of the spell in one of the Vance books well, and then prismatic spray appears in D yeah. and D well, uh, yeah that's that, that's and, definitely yeah. there but the funny thing is that whole that whole needing that whole um that whole approach to to um to the whole spells per day the eight hour rest and all mm -hmm. that. Um, yep, yep. It's been a while since I read through the Dying Earth books, but I don't remember that being there. I remember the whole memorization, because spells were treated as this hyper advanced form of math. Oh. Mm. But I definitely do remember they had the thing about the mage can only hold a certain number of spells in their mind at once. Yeah, and, and then, e um, even the most powerful wizards could only hold like three or four spells. In D and D, you have like twenty five different spells by the time you. Your tenth level well, memorized, but uh, so, some yeah. of I'd say some of that comes from the fact that um, Dying Earth wasn't the only thing that they were drawing from. But the problem is, yeah. um, Dying Earth has far, has far more in common with with say the adventures of the adventures of Sinbad in terms of what style of fantasy it's trying to be, as mm -hmm. opposed to okay, yeah. as as opposed to something like Lord of the something like Lord of the Rings, which obviously they were drawing from, which has subtle magic all all over the place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like you, yeah, you've got yeah. three, you've got three or four different magic systems, quote unquote, and none of them have anything in common. So, yeah, they're sort of mixed up together, aren't they? That yeah. that and everybody forgets that D and D was was um something of a successor to the chainmail um ga game that mm. was root that was root that was a skirmish war game because. Mm -hmm. Wargaming was really big in the seventies. Uh, mostly, mostly historical war games, but it didn't take long until one, until one thing led to another, and now you've got fantasy variants. Uh, and in a lot of the in something like chainmail, the wizard was meant to act as the artillery. Even even in modern war games, you still kind of see that the wizard having their own oh, phase, yeah, yeah. or the or yeah, sure. like Warhammer having a phase just for the casters. Mm, mm. Uh, but were there were th with some of these shifts that that happened? Were there any um, were there any classes that 
had that had to be give, had to be given the once over a few a few more times because something um, didn't fit. It has been. Uh, I mean, it, it's still most of the clusters are still very similar. We did take the opportunity with the barbarian, for example, to re rework rework the barbarian because that actually was the class that we got the most complaints about <laughs> and the uh half damage on the rage was, and the plus two the, like the whole the whole package was just too much i think and that did come through in the playing you know over the years it was slowly becoming clear that our bearing was too strong so he got the nerf um and i i think he's in a much better spot now um compared to before um in line with the other classes it's still the same in the sense that there's only two classes with magic in them so out of the nine classes you know seven of them are non-magical so you can still run the game and because healing is just based on short rests um it hit points us you know sort of more about your stamina and your second wind and your determination to continue uh than they are physical wounds you can get by easily in the game without any magic user or cultist in your party you don't need a dedicated healer you can just go into the dungeon or offering to the wilderness with a completely non-magical party and you'll be fine um so that's sort of similar um but the so the one class that actually i worry about <laughs> is uh the artificer and that's not really <clears throat> you know it's not really a i see it as this kind of Leonardo da Vinci, crazy inventor kind of character that comes around once a generation. Um, even rarer, I think, than, you know, a magic user or, or a cultist would be. But uh, so in the book, I put a little thing about, you know, check with your GM if all the classes are allowed, because I know that there's, there's not all GMs will want an artificer in their, in their setting, uh, in their campaign. So yeah. that's probably the other one that, We've kept a bit of a uh, and there's been a lot of little tweaks here and there just in terms of trying to um improve the playability of different classes but the main two would be barbarian got reworked magic user got reworked because of the roll to cast instead of the mm -hmm. yeah advancing in spell slots um and just a sort of uh, oh, i don't know cautionary label <laughs> on the artificer uh but otherwise most of them are uh, pretty similar to what we had in low fantasy game because they work quite they worked well most of them work very well but yeah there's been little tweaks to most yeah. of them. I could see why there there would be that contention with with the artificer because lar largely because of the way a lot of the ways that people view the technology level in in something yeah. like a sword sword and sorcery but yep there's there seems to be this idea that Something like the Artificer should only be in a steampunk setting like Eberron was. Mm, mm, well, mm. Eberron wasn't exactly steam, but you get you get the idea. Yeah. But yep, yep. the but um Artificers have is is a concept that's been that's been around even in even in more medi more um medieval or high medieval um periods. It yeah. was it was the madman who who knew how to who knew how to work more advanced mechanics like say the siege equipment that was used in that, that was used in um defending a castle or attacking a castle they're the type of person who is going to know how to how to um how to build those big those big ass arbalests or or crazy or something yeah yeah yep. and i do and even obviously obviously during the during the Renaissance, there were far there were far everybody was trying to be the next big inventor. But there's still there's still the whole thing with potions and well, using potions should be something of a gamble, shouldn't it? Yeah, the um, yeah, well, that's exact. That's right. The artificer in this game is is more suited to a Renaissance style level of technology, which is kind of contrary to your classic sword and sorcery um because he's mucking around with you know magnetism and electricity and yeah mutagens like these yeah they are sort of unstable 
potions that can give them random benefits. Um, but so they won't suit every campaign, but you know, they will suit some, and they are non magical. So it's supposed to be, it is supposed to be still grounded in reality. But I mean, of course, you know, we're taking a lot of liberties with, with, uh, with, uh, for example, oh, well, and firearms. So they're, they're the class that, in the default rules, they can have a firearm, like a one of a kind. They've created it. They figured out black powder or whatever, and you know, off they go. But I mean, if, if it's more of a obviously the later in time that you sort of, you know, maybe the firearms are everywhere in your campaign. But if but if you're in a sword and more sword and sorcery style, then um, you know, this is the guy who could have a gun, um, a primitive gun, but nevertheless very effective um, firearm, which which is as good as magic in some ways, I suppose. But uh, anyways, um, yeah, that's sort of where they're at. Yeah, yeah, you gotta be careful with them. That's all. Be careful before allowing the art of eyesight into your game. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, obvious. Obviously, and hold, hold on a minute. Mm. Okay, hopefully that fixed the whole thing with Discord. I just had to do a bit of um, finagling around with wires. Sorry about that. Okay, okay. No, no, no. But um, yeah, it's hear? it's always funny that a lot a lot of what's considered high fantasy is supposed to be taking its notes from medieval periods, but for some reason everybody acts like gunpowder doesn't exist in fantasy settings, mm, mm, which has mm. always always been strange to me because. Well, in the in the time periods that they're drawing from, gunpowder was a thing, a very a very oh. bleeding edge thing, but still a thing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think, yeah, um, I you know my history is bad, but it wasn't. I don't know. Didn't the Chinese have gunpowder in like uh, like I don't know very early on, very early on, um, compared to when um even plate mail came around anyway I, I forget the exact specifics but i understand what you mean yeah um now obviously obviously by the time europe had got had gotten a hold of it um china had been using it for a while they it was or it was 17th century when when um it started to really take over in europe um most mostly in the forms of cannons and of all and well, when we're dealing with fantasy, what's to stop an artificer from from lugging around a um ca a cannon to to deal with whatever's in a dungeon? Because there there'd be a there'd be a sight. <laughs> well, that's a, right. A, dra a dragon gets ready to fire a breath weapon, and then at the last minute gets shot in the mouth with a cannon. <laughs> well, the, the artificer in this game, you know, can have basically a hand cannon. Uh, mm. So. Yeah. Anyway, they're interesting. Um, yeah. We've. Uh, yeah. I yeah. um. I as bad as a movie as it was. I remember watching, um, Van Hel the Van Helsing movie and seeing. Oh, it was yeah. effectively a repeat. Was effectively a repeater, in the mm, form of mm. a crossbow. <laughs> mm, mm, Comple yeah, completely. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think I remember that same thing. <laughs> I'm like, why can't why can't we have why can't we have some something like that? Just just um have a crude version of a pro of a of what would be a prototype repeater and just say, and just say yeah. that somebody invented it in his in his backyard because he's completely nuts and nobody knows if yeah. the thing's going to actually work or blow up in his face. <laughs> yeah. No. I feel like that's the other aspect with um with an artificer that's that should be as much of a selling point is the fact that they um they have more passion than common sense and you never know when one of their inventions, whether it be a, whether it be a um, piece of equipment or even a potion, is going to actually work or not, or if it's going to blow up in your face, or in the case of potions, just chunky salsa. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I love that. I love that idea. I love it. 
I, I like more randomness in the game. If you can inject more randomness, I think that's generally that generally makes for a more enjoyable uh, session. Look, if Monty Python can finally get an RPG, then we have no excuse not to have a little bit of silliness. <laughs> and yes, that's that is a real thing. The the Monty Python co-curricular medieval reenactment program, which I'm told is not an RPG, even though it is, and <laughs> had a side game known as Fete la Vache. I I remember saying something about the Monty Python game. I never I didn't get it. I haven't read it, but I remember seeing it pop up. I think it did do exceptionally well. It and, did um, it did all right. It's currently I feel like out. It did really well. Oh yeah. Now one of the, one of the other things that's been that's that's been a um home that's been a hallmark for the longest time what is the um unique feature which I believe which um is has always been kind of the and the answer to um two subclasses in some in something like 5e and mm. were there in in this change between first and second edition were there any unique features that had to get tweaked or or even taken out just because of compatibility issues or was most of it able to carry over from one to the other Oh, that's a good question. I think most of them, we did tweak some, most of them were able to carry over uh, pretty okay. Um, we switched around the the magic user spellcraft um, cross-class unique feature. So if you want to be able to cast a couple of spells, um, you can choose one, but you the other one is randomly determined now instead of um, just getting to choose both. But <clears throat> the cultist one probably also the blessings um, cross class feature probably changed a little bit if you want to become if you want to kind of I mean yeah the unique features are the way which are really similar to you know feats from five E or from you know worlds without number or whatever mm -hmm. um, they're pretty similar to that. The starting point is that you can just you're encouraged to just make your own, make your own custom ability for your PC in conjunction with your GM, obviously. Um, that's the starting point. And then we, but, and that's how in low fantasy game, the original, there were no examples. It was just make your own ability. You'll be right. Everyone, you know, it's not that hard. <laughs> It'll be fine. Uh, but uh, we got a lot of calls for, oh, we need, we want some examples. We want some examples. So by the time low fantasy game deluxe rolled around, we, Put thirty examples or something in the book, and um, there's a mixture of in uh, in Tales of Argos. It's mm -hmm. it's a mixture of the unique features from Deluxe as well as LFG Companion, which was like a supplement book that came out later. Um, we, I've tried to kind of pick the best ones and the most interesting, the most fun ones, and put them into the into Tower. But um, yeah, they're mostly they're mostly fairly they were mostly fairly compatible. They didn't need too much tweaking because most of the cha the classes have not changed too much so i think yeah most of that is pretty good um yeah i don't think we need to just change them around too much but certainly the the uh starting point is still that we my preference anyway is that everyone should be making their own um you know you can use these ones in the book as a guide mm. but the idea is to make something truly custom for your character, get it approved by the GM, start playing with it, and just you know just keep an eye on it. If if it turns out to be too strong for the particular party that your PC is with, well, you can tweak it, you know, as you go. Um, I mean, that's another thing to do with um, any of these games. I think is that you know you want to tweak them to suit your table if you don't like some of the rules just ignore them or change them do whatever it is that will um uh, enable you to end up with the game with, that suits your preferences you know the best and in the back actually we've got a page of sort of variant rules to make the game you know more deadly less deadly mm -hmm. um, to all, make magic always... more unpredictable less unpredictable so um yeah the unique features is mm -hmm. In some ways, just an extension of customizing the game 
to, to suit you guys. And it came, it, that partly came about because when we were playing 5e, me and my main sort of group, we, we made our own feats from the start. So I remember making this feat, this sort of whip master for my rogue at the time. It was like an Indiana Jones style, um, <laughs> you know, whip guy. Uh, he could disarm people with his whip and it helped him when he was climbing and different. Indiana hurt, Jones hurt, or hurt, Castlevania? Hurt. Yeah. Uh, oh, I, I actually don't know Castlevania, but uh, I had in mind Indiana Jones. And uh, after making, after we made a couple of custom beats, I was like, this should be in every game. Every, yeah, everyone should just be doing this, making their own cool little abilities for their characters, as long as they're, um, you know, within the rough power range that the GM wants for their campaign, then yeah. it's all good. Yeah. Although, yeah. one. I think one one of the other um, one ah English, but I one thing that I get the feeling a lot of people coming in from you know five E or, or more traditional fantasy games mm. um, end up having a bit of a bit of time trying to get used to is the is the fact that on the ra on the race end of things that doesn't play as mu it it doesn't play as much of a um factor with a lot of um races it, or rather a lot the um the whole ability modifier i think a lot of people are still used to that concept and while that's somewhat present um in both little fantasy gaming and tales and tales of argoza um, nowhere near as much as it usually is. I'm get I'm guessing that's something that some people have had to get used to. Yeah, a little bit. Uh, one of the so yeah, I mean the both LFG and Toa the braces are quite similar. So the original idea was that you know in five E or whatever, if you, the elves get plus two to their decks, and so every thief you saw was a rogue. Every fighter was a half orc. Um, the strength bonus, uh, and I wanted to avoid that. So the attribute um, bonuses and penalties were stripped out, and instead we just put in um, <clears throat> other uh, benefits and penalties, if you like, uh, the races, which were sort of still consistent with the traditional um, themes of those races, but you could. You know, if you wanted to be a fighter, you could just as easily be, um, you know, a halfling fighter or a... I mean, you could always do that, of course, of course, uh, in standard D&D, but um, yeah, that was the basic principles that I... You tended to see the same races in the same classes um, popping up. Oh, so <laughs> Yeah, we, we, we... Yeah, I so, yeah, I pulled the attribute bonuses out for that reason. But, I remember um, yeah. when... Um... I remember when Wizards of the Coast tried to make a big deal of we find we got rid we got rid of ability mod we got rid of negative ability modifiers in fit in fifth edition. And I'm like, you had you didn't have negative ability modifiers back in fourth edition. The bigger question I should be asking is why'd you put them back in? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I know um, I know why they I know why they di they di they did it. In in five E, I just have to get. I just have to give them a lot of shit for, for yeah. you know, being the emperor in his new in his brand new outfit and all that. Yeah, and the funny yeah, yeah. Thing is, I mean, um, but in back in back and forth, the reason they got rid of the neg the negative ability modifier was they were having a harder time justifying the plus two equal and minus two pairing. So instead, they're like, pick one of these two abilities. You get a you get a modifier in that one. Yeah. Okay. It's been a while since I've played Five A, but I think I understand what you mean. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's and truth be told, by by not having it there, I get the feeling it um allows more room to exper to experiment with other features for the different races. Oh yeah, I think so. I think so. Although actually one one thing that we did put in there and which I feel like a lot of tables 
it was scrapped because they don't like the idea of it. But personally, I do. So I put in there <laughs> that uh, all, all the non-human races have particular personality traits which are kind of ingrained in that race, which I know is kind of contrary to... It's not realistic, right? But it's a fantasy game. And so the dwarves, for example, are greedy. The elves, you know, are arrogant and haughty. And so the GM can, from time to time, require a wheel check from your character to resist that natural inclination. So if the dwarf is presented with the opportunity for riches, you know, and he's just going to leave that treasure there and, and walk away, he might have to make a wheel check to see whether he can resist that, that dwarven trait. Or the elf, you know, if they have the opportunity to demonstrate elven superiority and their arrogance, well, you know, it might be bad for the negotiations that are going on with this NPC, but the GM might require from time to time a will check to resist, you know, resist that sort of manifesting. Um, and that was, I put that in there because I don't like the idea of the elves just being humans with pointy ears or the dwarves just being humans with big beards and short, stumpy guys. Um, I really wanted the traditional sort of... Um, uh, stereotypical um, racial traits to come through in the game as part of the gameplay. Uh, so that's why I put that in there. But yeah, as I say, I do suspect a lot of people ignore that. <laughs> Don't uh, roll with it. But I, I think it adds something, you know, just to make to make those characters a bit different. Mm -hmm. Now, with that in, with that in mind. Um, one of the things I did notice just looking at the character just looking at the character sheet for TOA versus <coughs> the original yeah was moving initiative into the into the attribute section which is oh, yeah, okay. very interesting to me yeah yeah the uh, so this is also something taken from low life so initiative is now an attribute and it's the average it's a derived attribute though so you don't roll for it like the others it's it's the average of your dexterity and your intelligence is your attribute score so part of the reason for that was you know d classically dexterity is such an important you know from a min maxer point of view in D, &D it's often the god stat if you like mm -hmm. um because of finesse, finesse weapons, and, and it's also your AC, and it's also your initiative. It's all these things. It's your stealth roll. Um, it's such an important stat. One of the things I wanted to do was reduce the importance of dexterity, and that, was, that primarily comes around two ways. One is that your initiative score is now average of intelligence and dex, and intelligence also, I think, needed a boost. It was often a dump stat, but uh, because initiative is pretty important, um, you know, we sort of propped up in intelligence for non-magic user or artificer classes um, by tying it to your initiative. And the other way we reduce the importance of dexterity is that we made ranged weapons, the attack bonus and the damage bonus is based on your perception attribute rather than your dexterity. So dex is part of your initiative, it's your AC bonus, and it's, you know, your bonus for when you're making a luck save to jump out of the way or something. Yeah. Uh, and it's also your stealth, you know, you roll against decks for stealth. Yeah. So still very important stat, but not as important as it, you know, traditionally is like you in said, the D&D style game. Like you said, God stat. And truth yeah. be told, yeah. the idea of dexterity being used for um, ranged weapons like bo like bows always, stru always struck me as a bit silly. Um, about as about as silly as the as this idea of like some ninety five pound girl uh, wielding wielding an English longbow. If you ever <laughs> if you've ever tried to pull if you ever tried to draw a bow, you know that you're if you're if you're that skinny, you're gonna have a hard time drawing those things. It takes <laughs> a lot of strength to draw even a small bow. Oh uh, yeah, I, I'm sure. I'm sure. Let alone the bigger ones, and even even more so if um. If you're if you're trying to reload like a crossbow, I mean it's not going to be as intensive as drawing a standard bow, but it is. It's not going to be easy unless you. Yeah, oh, well, that's why that's why they got that witch thing on them, don't they? Because it's 
it'd be it's hard and it's 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 hard it's hard work yeah i mean oh like with a um with like with like a standard crossbow the only way to make it easier mm. is if you use a crank and and with those cranks you have to be very particular with how, with how you do it other otherwise mm. the rhythm's going to get thrown off and you got to do it all over again and if you're doing it the old fashioned way um I'm not sure if you if you've done it or seen, but you've got but you have to put your feet down on the boat yeah. and then y and then yank it up, and that's yeah. I know, I know what you mean. Yeah, mm -hmm. there's that little loop to put your foot through, and then they pull it up. Yeah, it's yeah. I'm sure, it's not easy. It is. It isn't. <laughs> oh, it's <laughs> that sounds like personal experience. Yeah, it's easier than drawing a okay. bow, but that's kind of like but that's kind of like saying it's. Um, easier to get over the pain of getting punched in the balls rather than kicked in the balls. <laughs> like, right on, right on. Yes, you're, yeah. you're still going to be on the ground in pain, <laughs> and <laughs> it's still not fun. Is what you're telling me? It's still not fun. Yeah, no, and I know, I know that in a lot of cases there's usually an action penalty, but it's just the idea of um high, of high dext of using dexterity as the primary stat for those for those sort of ranged weapons um and ev even even if we're dealing with even if we're dealing with firearms i've always i've always house ruled it that for certain ranged weapons you needed to have a strength minimum um because of that oh yeah 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 if you're if you're dealing with bows or crossbows obviously needing it for just drawing the thing um and in the case of firearms well recoil's a thing no matter no matter how yeah. no matter how strong you are, you're gonna be dealing with with um, recoil. And yeah, 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 absolutely. Like, yeah, I was re I was recently watching a video from Kentucky Ballistics where he was firing the infamous four bore, this Christian firearms falling block um, firearm, which oh, the there's there's like two hundred pounds of felt recoil on the thing. The bu the bullet <laughs> is the bit. The barrel is one inch in diameter. <laughs> it it he it is. Oh, no, no. And ima imagine just some imagine just some small halfling just trying to fire say a um say an er an early hand cannon. <laughs> uh, it's like it's like out of the, uh, the movies where the guy gets thrown backwards from his own. Well, I, I know I've referenced discharge. the noisy cricket bef before with you. I always like using those sort of things of. Powerful but completely unsafe weaponry. And <laughs> if you remember the movie Men in Black, whenever the noisy cricket was fired, yeah, Jay would get, right. fi would get fired like twenty like twenty yards the opposite direction. He'd like fly back into a car, windscreen or something. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. Oh, it's right up my alley. Yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, because because of course it's doing this massive so sonic blast and. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction, and yeah, even 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 just a even just a standard sized um, fi just a standard sized rifle, you're still going to be dealing with some kick. You're still going to get punched in the shoulder. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. Oh, um, and true and truth be told, there's always been the issue of some of some die types. Not die types. Some stats being, um, a bit, being a bit more used than others. Um, where you and I are, mo you and I are more than familiar with the stigma that charisma gets. Yeah, true, true. Mm. You know, as e as either the dump stat or what, or for the bard who abuses it, the. The um dip the diplomats the diplomancer st stat so that he can go screw everybody, figuratively and literally. <laughs> like the uh, that's like it reminds me of the um shadow run uh face face romancer or something where just um they're just uh, called faces. Convince everybody to do everything. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, but. With that, with that in mind, in play te in playtesting tales of our Argo of Argosia, are there any were there were there any sort of ish any sort of um 
issues that you that ended up cropping up during playtesting that you that you had to um, mess ar mess around with to get to work or so, or some stuff that you thought was a surefire winner but didn't quite hit the mark. Yeah, well, there was there was certainly so at first I had um, a magic user when they cast when they used to cast spells their intelligence would reduce by one with every casting and that was something we lifted from the life 2090 actually um but it and it works all right in low life because you can you can inflate your intelligence by using certain drugs and um cyberware and so on uh but in Tua, you know it's just 3d6 down the line is the is the standard um attribute creation uh, attribute role so you will but, but with the safety net of a you get at least 115 and 113 so you can you can increase something to you know to 15 or 13 if you need to but um but most magic users will have you know 15 or 16 intelligence generally and <clears throat> so and also that's right that in in a fantasy style game there just tends to be more combat uh than in a cyberpunk you know kind of uh they're often you know mission based um kind of mysteries half the time there's just not that much there just doesn't seem to be as much combat and as much spell casting going on as in a fantasy game so yeah. whilst it was okay to start with intelligence 19 and drop it down to 14 whatever in the life 2090 that did not work <laughs> in uh in Toma. if you had 15 as you're starting you know within five spells you're at 10 and you're rolling against that 10 to cast your next spell so it just was a bit too harsh and it really it did come through in the playtesting and people were like this is <laughs> we don't like this <laughs> so, all right so we got rid of that and instead uh we tweaked the i think there's definitely in this edition there's more of an emphasis and it was always there was always a bit of an emphasis for this but certainly in this edition there's a more of an emphasis on short and sharp adventures right which only go for a few sessions for example or just one session and um so what we did do to try and increase the uh unpredictability of magic was we used to have a d20 roll for the dark and dangerous magic check every time you cast a spell you roll d20 it starts at a one if you roll a one it triggers this you know bad effect uh not necessarily bad but dangerous effect right could be dangerous to anybody in the vicinity um, and if it didn't trigger, then it went up to two, and it went up to three, and it kept going up until it triggers. Um, but for Toa, because the adventures are intended to be shorter, um, we did decide, we did end up tweaking that. And this actually was an was a idea from one of our guys on Discord, JD, from JD RPG Productions. Thank you, JD. Uh, we changed the D20 to a D8 to start with. At level one to three, you roll a D8. Level four to six, you roll a d10, and uh, seven to nine, you roll a d12. And for magical items, because it's it, the dark and dangerous magic check applies to all magic, not just magic users. If you want to drink a potion, or you want to use a special ability on your magic sword, you have to roll for a, a ddm um, check as well. So magic items are still a d20, but for for the magic user, um, yeah, it just helps trigger those dangerous effects more often so that we tend to see at least you know one trigger per adventure whilst whilst before um with low fantasy game because it had more hit points and it was more it was a longer drawn out attrition game as long as you were pl playing a decent sort of length adventure you would still see a trigger but yeah just over the last few years i mean actually to be honest ever since low fantasy game came out i was making these adventure frameworks which were like short adventures and i I never actually really considered them as proper adventures, right? These were like little side tracks or whatever. Mm -hmm. But people were playing them, and they were play they were just playing them. That's all they played, just the adventure frameworks. And I'm like, holy shit! I mean, if this is, um, if this works, just playing the shorter adventures, will you'll never see a DDM trigger. Yes, <laughs> it wasn't really the game wasn't really designed with 
such short adventures in mind. So anyway, that's another thing that we had to tweak. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. So made primarily around magic. Um, what else? Uh, there's been heaps. There's been heaps of little um, tweaks here and there, but they're probably the major ones. Now I know that it's in playtesting. You do have a um, you do have a soft launch page when it comes to the Kickstarter. But what would you be shooting for as far as the la the launch of the Kickstarter, and how long do you oh, see I that? I can't hear at the moment. If you're if you're talking, Bill Joe. Oh god damn! Not again! I don't know what's going on with Discord, but it really does not <laughs> like me tonight. It doesn't. But oh, dear. what I was saying, what I was saying was, um, what would you? I know that the Kickstarter for it is on is on the horizon. When do you see that going live, and how long do you see that um, running? Uh well, at the moment is scheduled for. It's penciled in for late February, mm -hmm. um, and probably go for you know the usual sort of thirty days. Um. Yeah, I'm going to see how we go. Yeah. Uh, got my fingers crossed. Yep. 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 I mean, so there's still, so it's, the game's been in, the new edition's been in playtesting since sort of September. In closed playtesting with the guys, anyone who had bought Low Fantasy Gaming Deluxe got access to the playtest document back in September, basically, and then so sort of got early access to it. And then I put out the, just the public playtest um, document on drive through. Uh, just the other day, like on the 1st of, I think it was the 1st or the 2nd of January. So now it's sort of uh, available to the to anybody who wants to download it. So yeah, it's like it's like 240 something pages. It's basically the whole game, right? <laughs> For free. Uh, but there are pages which, you know, don't have any art and, they're, you know, things will obviously still be tweaked um, between now and the, the Kickstarter finalizing. And the idea is that I'll add some extra content as well because 240 something pages we can still add you know 10 20 pages maybe um and keep it within the price bracket uh that i want to keep it in so um just a matter of finalizing what that extra material will be uh but yeah for the for the moment looking at late february unless something goes probably wrong although i did just learn the other day which i didn't realize or i'd forgotten that like february is like design month but where all design creators all jump on there and make their design. So I, I don't want to be competing with that. I don't know what I'm going to do. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so anyway, it might get pushed back to March. We will see. We will see. Well, I'll certainly be looking forward to it, wh whichever form it takes. But with that <laughs> said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness that happens around here. No, thank you so much. I, I really appreciate uh, you know you having me on the drive. It's been it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> Absolutely. Cheers to that. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!